hills, that's what the Lenny Lenape Indians called this land and where the name Marchung got its origin. The Indians frequented this place during the winter months for game, which was more than plentiful. But they found much more than just food. They found a beautiful land that was serene and lush. It had its own waterfall, which ran full and strong, and a breathtaking view of the grand terrain far below. The history of Hua Chung begins between 1670 and 1680, and is entwined in the legend. The story goes a party of Dutch settlers from the Amboys went in search of a new place to live and farm. Led by Captain Michelson, they followed the Indian path through the notch in the mountains of what is now called Somerset Street and set up camp on a slope above Stony Brook. That evening, all of the group went to sleep except one, who remained on guard duty. As the night progressed, an Indian scout named Deer Prong came upon the camp, surprised the guard, and was fired upon. Thinking the scout had died and fearing possible retaliation from other Indians, the settlers quickly departed. However, Deer Prong was only wounded and followed them but not before leaving a tree message for his chief with an easy trail to track. Chief One Feather came upon the message and quickly dispatched two other scouts to find Deer Prong. Within a short time, the scouts returned with Deer Prong, who related his tale. Eager to take revenge, a plan was made to trap the settlers. Deer Prong went on ahead to find them and would light a signal fire when found. Unfortunately, he was discovered by his own flame and fired upon. A fight to the death ensued with Deer Prong hurtling the body of his victim down a cliff. The Indians won the attack and brought the captives back to the encampment for torturing and burning. Captain Michelson was the unfortunate first person to be taken back to the torturing post. It was at that time that Watumka, a half-breed Indian tr princess who was traveling with the Dutch, intervened. She had been living with them to learn the ways and who had by chance saved the life of Chief One Feather in Amboy years earlier. Watumka, using Indian craft and knowledge and using the shadows to her advantage, crept up and set Michelson free. She then disclosed herself to the Indians and pleaded for her friend's freedom. The Indian Council assembled and decided that the land would be divided with the Indians getting the east and the settlers getting the west. The pact was sealed with One Feather and Watumka being joined in an Indian marriage. In 1911, a group of Wachung residents got together to reenact the story. The show was done on the land behind Burrow Hall and included Watumka Falls, named for the brave princess, which was the supposed site of the Indian and settlers' encounter. The production was done a number of times after that, and many local residents were part of it. They were quite great. They had real horses, and um, when they would throw the dummy over the, to the top of the hill, um, they would all scream. Or hang in As a little kid, I can remember um, crying, thinking that uh, they were being killed. and. Uh, it was quite exciting, and you almost thought that they were real Indians, you know, killing the fighting looked real. They built covered wagons, and they had open bonfires, and um, Indians riding on horses through the woods above the Burl Hall, um, and above Wetumpka Falls, and um, it was all very lifelike. and. Um, they had settlers and Indians and teepees and very, it was a big thing in town. Every year they put it on. During the American Revolution, the Wachung area served as an important advantage to George Washington. First, there were three notches in the mountains that colonial troops used when they were encamped in Morristown. Secondly, there was Washington Rock that George Washington used as an observation point to view the movements of troops on the plains below or the activities of ships in Raritan Bay. Once, Lord Cornwallis tried to seize the pass of Somerset Street, but Washington saw what the British were planning and had the pass guarded. Cornwallis' plan was defeated and he marched his army in retreat to the coast where they sailed across the bay to Staten Island. In the 1700s, maps showed the locations of local taverns for troops' knowledge as meeting, eating, drinking, and the entertainment establishments. One such tavern was built in the 1720s on Upper Somerset Street. Over the years, it had many owners. 
It was known as David Stewart's Tavern in, the, in 1806 and the Demler Hotel in the late 1840s. Finally, it became known as the Washington House, for it was reputed that Washington had once stopped there. The hotel continued operation until 1963, when a fire completely destroyed the structure. In the late 1800s, Wachung was called Washingtonville, and many buildings stood on the gorge of Stony Brook. Among them was the first industry to come to Wachung. The Grand Valley Flouring Mill was built in 1823. It was sold to Moses French in the mid-1800s, along with the pond next door. He had three run of stones and ground both custom and merchant flour with the capabilities of 100 bushels every 12 hours. In the later part of the century, the mill was sold to Hippolyte Texier. He was a glove importer, Texier. He had a store at Canal Street, New York City. And from that store, they did some glove business, uh, cut the, the chamois at what was called the Old Mill. They bought that uh, mill and uh, the property across the street and built a home in there. And uh, they moved from uh, the old farm down into the uh, Black Chunk Center about 192 or 3. In the late 1920s, the mill was demolished and the present day Borough Hall was built. Other industries in early days of Wachung included copper mines, a trapped rock quarry that used water power from nearby Wetumpka Falls to crush the stones, and an ice house which delivered the frozen water to homes and businesses in the Plainfield area. In 1984, a concrete dam was built on the pond of the mill, increasing the size of it five times. A lake was formed and the Plainfield Ice and Supply Company was erected. We would get out of school and at the time then, uh, it w the lake would freeze over, of course, very early. And uh, we always skated on it. And at one time, I lived on the lake for a short time while this house was being built. And we had a marvelous time because we could go right out the back door and right down on the pond to skate. And um, we'd come home, we'd get out of school, and before we went home, we'd always take a run over to the lake. And the, uh, they had a um, trough uh, built so that when they cut the ice, uh, which of course always was cut in blocks of about, it must have been about a foot thick because there was a lot of ice on that lake at the time. And they cut those blocks and then they would float them over to the little trough and then they'd uh, uh, guide them up the trough and into the, by a conveyor belt and into the ice house. So we kids would get uh, at the end of the trough and the men were great. They'd help us onto the ice and we'd ride the, ride the ice until it started, you know, until it was ready to go in the ice house and then we'd jump off. That was our afternoon fun. In 1933, the ice house burned down and one of Wachung's leading industries came to an end. When it burned down, they hadn't used it for about three years because um, the winters weren't cold enough and they didn't, weren't getting enough ice um, to keep it going but it was filled with hay and it had a lot of um, farm implements and things inside of it when it burned down. And it contained 10 rooms and it had a, um, oh, some kind of a thing in the center that moved the ice along. Um, I don't know, I was really pretty young when it burned down, but my father was the fire chief at the time and um, my uncle is the one who discovered the fire, and it was burned down in half an hour. It was full of, the walls were full of sawdust, and it, they never replaced it. In the early 1930s, the lake was converted into a resort. A beach of white sand and modern facilities were built. That was where um, all the kids, in Wachung, I don't think there was one child in Wachung when we were little, would spend our summer, practically. We'd go there, I think it opened at 10 o'clock, and um, it would close, I think, at 10 at night, too, most, some of the time, uh, during the week, anyhow. And um, <clears throat> we'd go home for supper, and we'd end up being back there, of course, so we could play with the kids. And 
we had a great time. We had a swim team, and uh, once a year they would have a, a, oh, a show with the water ballet, and they'd have clowns. They, I guess it was the lifeguards dressed up as clowns, and they'd do all kinds of dives off the tower. We used to call it the tower, which was the high dive. <coughs> And uh, we had rowboats there, and we used to, you know, go out and on the upper part where the swimmers weren't, and we used to uh, ride around, and some of the kids would fish, and it was just a place to go for the summer. And uh, of course, all our friends were there, and uh, we had great times. We had a picnic once a year, and it was all free for the Watch Young residents, so we never had to pay. It was just like one big family. Oh, the beach club. The lakes are a favorite of, I guess, all the kids in Wachung because we we used to go there every day after school, and we each, we had like three or four blankets full of teenagers, and we all spent all our time at the lake. And some of us worked there in the refreshment stand and in the uh, ticket booth, and um, we used to, they had flags around the edge of the water you weren't supposed to go past the flags, and they had lifeguards who rode boats and watched people. And one of our things was to swim the flags. We'd swim all the way around the flags every day. And um, we just had a good time. We, there were a bunch of us. The Washington House wasn't the only hotel that Wachung had. What is now O'Connor's restaurant had its own interesting past. In 1888, Henry Pettiflew, a chef in New York hotels, bought this building and turned it into a hotel and restaurant, which was renowned for its steak and mushroom dishes. As far as we know, it's been a hotel restaurant. Henry Pettiflew, of course, owned it for years, or his family, uh, and entertained different celebrities as they stopped here over the years on their way from the Morristown to New York, and Laurel and Hardy, Mae West, Joe Lewis. for the future of cable today? Are you ready? Through the use of fiber optics, TKR Cable is hard at work rebuilding the system to give you, the viewer, much, much more. Currently, system engineers are hard at work bringing this technology right into your home. The result will mean more channels, improved picture quality, and even interactive programming. All at the simple press of a button. TKR, you ready? The future waits for no one. That's why TKR is planning it today. Drafting a master blueprint for the architecture of tomorrow. Technology will have a new twist, a new face, and your world will never be the same. Hey, Princess, how's your homework going? Fine. I've been doing it all afternoon. Good. Once you finish it, then you can go out. TKR, Beyond Television. Basically, it goes back into the uh, uh, 18, between 1860 and 1880 would be the original. I don't have the definite date, but in that time, they, they made it a one-room schoolhouse. And uh, it stayed that way for quite a while until the 19, late 1920s, when they raised the basic building uh, up high and they poured the first floor under it, which is a very unique way of doing things. Uh, the bottom part is all poured concrete, and then they lowered the wooden frame back on top. And of course, we had, to, I think, three grades in the room, uh, for instance, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So I skipped seventh, because if you were in sixth, seventh, or eighth, and you got bored with what you were doing, you, you listened to the other grades. <laughs> you practically learned. We reviewed everything from grade six and learned everything from grade seven and skipped to grade eight. And I graduated from there. For a while, it was the, again, it was the school, four rooms, down, two rooms downstairs, two rooms upstairs. And then it became a library for a while. And then the library was built in the back. And uh, 
they abandoned the building and for a while it was just empty and, and people, you know, kids got into it and vandalized it. And then uh, about, uh, I would say about 12, 13 years ago, the uh, art center committee came in and took over without a lease and uh, they were going to have theater productions and they just cleaned it up. They didn't really do anything, no physical improvements. We had a lot of shows, we had art shows and, and uh, concerts and things like that. And finally, there was a controversy between the Board of Education, which owned the building, and the Art Center, and the Board of Education wanted to get rid of it. And I went before the town board, and I, uh, and I convinced them that they should buy the building from the Board of Education and let us have it, because already we were being recognized in the local real estate papers as the cultural center for the whole area. So, I mean, we were getting popular without us even knowing it. And uh, they, they did, you know, after a couple of meetings, they, they transferred the building, and then uh, I got them with their lawyer to, to give us a lease for 10 years for a dollar a year. In the early 1900s, a post office came to the town and discovered a second Washington bill in the state. So in 1926, Washingtonville, with a population of 900, became the borough of Wachung, and Harry B. McDonald was its first mayor. Soon after that, a police force was started and they utilized the old Texier home as their station for a long time until a fire in recent years closed the building down. However, the first fire company was begun earlier in 1910. It was all volunteer and they used their first firefighting apparatus, a hand-drawn truck, four years later. Within this land of tall green trees, beautiful wildflower, and a dazzling waterfall, would you believe that in this place, a castle once stood? It was built by Dr. Richard Moldenke in the early 1900s. He modeled the structure after a castle in Germany where his mother was born. She happened to be a descendant from the house of von Montufel, who were known to have fought in the Third Crusade with Frederick Barbarossa. Moldenke called his castle Elsinore in honor of his mother. My first recollection of the castle wasn't really of the castle. It was of the mausoleum. And um, I was with my brother, and we were about seven and eight years old, walking in the woods. We lived about a, oh, a couple tenths of a mile through the woods from the castle. And we came upon this hill walking through the woods with trees growing out of it. And up on top of the hill, we saw a big opening, and it was a manhole cover. Um, we looked down, it looked bottomless, and we went around the, the side. There was a small stream there, and um, there were big iron gates. Uh, I think they said warning dynamite or danger dynamite. And I remember a couple of kids just prying these gates open and going inside, and my brother and I, a couple blinks of the eyes as we're getting adjusted to the light in there, and all of a sudden we realized we were right in the middle of a mausoleum with broken open caskets, uh, holes in the wall, and about the time we blinked our eyes the third time, I think we set quarter mile records through the woods, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget that as long as I live, finding that mausoleum and not really knowing it was part of the castle or knowing that it was there and how creepy it was. It was an, a, a crazy place. It was an unbelievable, um, huge, huge um, castle. I mean, towers. There was a cannon on it. Um, it was just like out of a medieval story. Uh, inside the castle, there was um, laboratories, machine shops. The laboratory to a child, uh, you know, of my age was like, just like being out of Frankenstein. We used to go up there for our eggs. One of the uh, tenants uh, had chickens and sold eggs. And of course, by that time, it had changed very much. The inner part of the castle was interesting, too, because the dining room was entirely enclosed with a skylight. And there was a very uh, interesting hall um, candelabra, as I can remember. It was, uh, uh, I think it was made of guns, if I remember correctly. And uh, then um, uh, the other thing I remember was the music room. And at the time that the uh, 
had had changed hands a few times, and there were children in the castle. That became a ping pong room and a game room. <laughs> so that it had been, it had many changes. I was very sorry to see it go. In 1969, the castle was destroyed by a fire, and all traces of it, except for the mausoleum, have vanished. I remember years ago, my father went to visit a family, and they, uh, it was Christmas time, and they didn't have a tree or any gifts or anything, and he went and took our tree and our gifts and gave it to the family. <laughs> Because I was so young, I guess he felt I wouldn't know the difference, and so, but that was what people did, and uh, and all the all the uh, teenagers, we felt like we were all cousins. We knew each other so well. Well, it was very slow living. You realize our roads were not mechanics; they were all ruts. As a Five, six year old, I walked almost two miles from my home to the schoolhouse. Uh, no automobiles, you had horse and wagons. Uh, the uh, farmers, of course, did their shopping about once a week maybe in the town of Plainfield if they needed certain things. Otherwise you you lived on a farm and lived off that farm. You had your chickens for eggs, meat, ducks, the same, same with geese, pigs. You had a horse, you had cows for milk, butter, cheese. And we also were privileged to have on uh, Fridays or Saturdays a couple of wagons that would come through with uh, meats, meat wagons. And they'd have all kinds of meats that you need. Uh, I can remember one of them used to slice off a piece of bologna, give it to me. That was a great thing to eat, that slice of bologna. <laughs> Everybody was involved in the community. There were always, um, you know, lots of people willing to volunteer. There were lots of sports programs for the kids. Um, it was always a good feeling. Um, I don't know, growing up in Wachung, it was like, sort of like a wholesome experience. Um, you know, we had lakes, we had streams. Um, you know, when I was a kid, kids could just go out on their own at eight, nine, ten years old and go all over town, play in the woods. Um, you know, the, the legends and, and the castle and, um, you know, the woods and the hills were all something that was, you know, nice to grow up with. With wonderful memories that Wa Chung has to offer, there are, as we have heard, unpleasant ones as well. Well, there was a very eerie morning, a Saturday, and uh, it was raining so hard that we couldn't see the across the street. Uh, but I would say after 9 o'clock, and it was just raining, and uh, uh, you could see the, uh, a brook uh, start to rise, and water gets over the road and then you can, uh, can go uh, proceed up to the circle. Our, our really our identifying mark for years was Wetemka Falls. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been partially destroyed uh, in the flood of 73. We've attempted to get permission or to rebuild it, but the cost is prohibitive. The, uh, the laws today are so restrictive to get something done that they don't want anybody touching anything with the environment. But if you should happen to walk down Somerset Street, and you really can't see it because of the vegetation, when you get past the, uh, the concrete part of the wall and they got the stone gabions, as you go, if you, you can go down there, if you go down there, and you'll see, you're like in another world, you'll see the falls, but instead of being a big drop, it's a gradual drop, and you see all the stone castings that come down from there. The future of White Young is a lot like it is today. Uh, the future of White Young is we 
retaining our rateables, retaining our tax structure as we have it today, and yet providing the services that the watch young citizens need, whether it be facilities, whether it be the staff, the people that work for us, uh, and how they're treated and what services we provide for the people. We have, uh, with the state redevelopment, we classified to we'll call it the village center, the village square, whatever you want to call it. And what that is intended to do is to bring in the center of town. And the two lakes comprise Wachung, Best Lake over on the east side and, and uh, Wachung Lake. And we endeavor to make the circle, modify it, change it, uh, enhance it with all of the things that are necessary and still keep it a, tr a safe place and make it one big uh, community, a village square, a village center, and that ties it in. You will see the lake being developed in, within a year, you see some work being done there today. The tree stumps are being ground by state law. They have to, any trees that are there had to be cut down. You will see the lake uh, dam rebuilt according to standards. You'll see uh, Watch on Lake Dredge, as soon as we get the proper permits, it's being studied right now by the engineers. You will see uh, walkways throughout the lake, you will see uh, gazebo, you will see a uh, fishing area that's there now, but will be enhanced with grassy slopes, uh, potentially ice skating ring down at the bottom, lamps lining the walkways and the path around the lake. Uh, you'll see an enhancement of the lake, which will tie in with Best Lake at the other end, okay? and. Uh, this is what we visualize as Wachung being, a very rural, peace-like, very tra tranquil setting. Today, Wachung doesn't have much industry left. We do have small manufacturers and retail stores, and the area where Lockheed stood on Route 22 is currently being rezoned and redeveloped for new commercial shops. The community spirit has always been strong, and volunteerism is still very important. There is still a volunteer fire department, as well as a rescue squad, which constantly serve the public in a very efficient manner. But still, Wachung is Wachung, and um, the people are very friendly, and I think it's a beautiful town. And um, I love the, you know, the deers that come in on my backyard every winter. Um, I know people complain about it, but. They were here first, and we feed them in the winter and put apples out for them. And um, the school system was great for my kids, and um, it still is great. And um, those things, I think, are very important. And it's a friendly town. <laughs>